Times sure are changing, aren't they? It feels like every day now, some huge thing that we grew up with just all of a sudden starts crashing and burning into non-existence. And as you probably gleaned from the title of this video, the anime industry is for sure no exception. To be honest, you'd be pretty surprised at how many studios and directors have just faded into obscurity over the years. Though here's the thing, and I'm sure you've all been wondering this too, where has Gynax been? After basically being a factory for stellar anime for over a decade, it seems like they just all of a sudden vanished completely. Hell, even now, one of their most beloved properties, Fooly Cooly, is getting both a second and third season with Gynax nowhere to be found on the credits. So the question is, what happened? Hello everyone, this is the RPG Monger, and as a huge fan of Gynax myself, with them making my actual favorite anime series of all time, I've been more than confused as to why the once massive anime studio has seemingly dropped off the radar. Well, to fully explain just what has happened, we're gonna have to go back a decade or three. Officially founded in 1984 and having origins as far back as 1980, Gainax's impact on anime in general has been immense. However, while a good majority of anime studios have either a prolific name attached to them or just a reputation of putting out solid hits, Gainax had no such luxury in the beginning, almost meeting a premature death as a result on multiple occasions. Though let's not get too ahead of ourselves here, as before we get to the fall, we have to talk about the rise. You see, when Gynax was first founded, it was actually primarily made up of another studio called Daikon Film, a studio whose short films were really the only experience any of Gynax's members had up until that point. But also unlike other studios, there was one thing that Gynax had up its sleeve that pretty much saved the studio in its early days, and that was the company's president, Toshio Okada. Since as a founding member of both Daikon Icon Film and Gynax, he also happened to run another little company called General Products, a store which would produce and sell sci-fi goods. This would prove to be invaluable to Gynax, as not only would the studio not have to pay licensing fees when they'd make products based on their productions, it also served as quite the financial backup for their pursuits. And it doesn't end there, because through the connections General Products had with Bandai, Gynax came into contact with Shiga Watanabe, an anime producer which, for better or for worse, definitely ripped the training wheels right off of Gynax. You see, at the time, with Gynax just being formed and all, they of course wanted to begin creating their own anime. And they even had one pitched to Bandai, but with Watanabe on their side, what would have been a small OVA was transformed into a full theatrical project, geared to compete with the likes of Hayao Miyazaki himself, with Studio Ghibli's newest movie, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Of course, that being said, a project of such scope is nothing to scoff at, with the full budget of the film ending up costing around 800 million yen. On one hand, Gynax couldn't have been given a better opportunity to make a real name for themselves, but at the same time, you have to remember, these weren't experienced veterans of the industry. These were just a bunch of people in their 20s, fresh out of university, and when given such a responsibility, it proved to be a double-edged sword. Originally, when pitching this idea, the OVA wasn't even meant to have a widespread audience. Instead, much like the shorts produced under Daikon Film, it was really only meant for the sci-fi convention attendees at Osaka, resulting in the entire project being pretty niche from the get-go. So in turn, once the small OVA transformed into what would become Royal Space Force the wings of can't pronounce that, it ended up not doing doing all that great, with the film's failure to hit the mainstream causing Gynax to be put in a pretty sticky situation. But somehow, in a twist of fate, this wouldn't be the end of Gynax. After that whole situation surrounding the wings of mayonnaise, Bandai offered Gynax one final deal. If the team at Gynax could come up with an anime that would end up selling over 10,000 copies, then Bandai would fund it completely. And while at this point they had already downsized 
quite a bit back into their previous location, Gynax knew they could not pass this chance up. So in comes Gunbuster, Gynax's newest original OVA, which after some internal confusion, ended up being directed by a young Hideaki Anno, who at least nowadays is more well known for another specific mecha anime. But this wasn't the only project underway at Gynax, since with them once again returning to the larger building they were in, Gynax began to explore a whole new world of uncharted territory, video games. More specifically, PC games, because when Takami Akai, another longtime member of Gynax, realized how great of an asset all of the animators they had were for video games, Akai had struck a gold mine. Now with some animators creating art for said video games, Gynax released Cybernetic High School, a PC game that catered to a more specific audience, with the whole gist of the game having the player answer questions to strip female characters, a concept that unsurprisingly became quite popular in the years to come. Needless to say, it was quite the hectic time for Gynax, and things wouldn't be getting calmer anytime soon, with Gynax facing the first of its many leadership struggles. Enter Hiroaki Inoue, a founding member of Gynax brought on to be their producer, and since he was really their only professional producer, in the company, he'd kind of become the backbone of Gynax, dealing with the majority of budgeting and Gynax's relationship with Bandai. Though then, there was the president of Gynax, the aforementioned Toshio Okada, who wasn't exactly the most organized person around. Just take a previous situation from when he ran General Products, where staff had gone as far as to stage walkouts against him solely due to how disorganized he was while running things. So obviously, seeing how Okada was hurting Gynax more than helping at this point, Inoue challenged Okada for his position at Gynax and brought on Takeshi Sawamura from General Products to help run the company. This would be the beginning of Gynax's steady decline into absolute chaos. You see, right when this struggle was taking place, NHK, Japan's primary public broadcasting network, was approaching Gynax with a production proposal for a completely new project, and taking advantage of the company's current disarray, Inoue was quick to intercept and take control of this proposal, going as far as to send his specific pitch for the project all behind Okada's back. Soon, this specific pitch would evolve into Nadia the Secret of Blue Water, but unfortunately for him, things wouldn't go as Inoue hoped. While his pitch would be accepted, once the rest of Gainax learned about what Inoue had been doing, they immediately went to NHK demanding that Inoue would be removed completely from Nadia moving forward. And as a result, Inoue would not only end up leaving the project, but Gynax as a whole jumping to AIC later on. And even though he may be completely gone from the company, he would continue to hinder it far beyond his departure. Fun fact about Nadia, the actual concept of the series was pitched by Miyazaki himself, with him dropping out of the project soon after. Though with him leaving the project adrift without a director, it was soon passed on to a familiar face, a slightly more experienced Hideaki Anno. Now, in terms of Gynax, Nadia was really the last thing they needed, because not only was Inoue's proposal way too risky for the studio to handle in their current state, but Gynax's unprofessional work environment was just not equipped to handle the full brunt of a TV anime. This could partially be attributed to, yet again, Okada's laziness with the studio, allowing directors and writers to all work on their scripts outside the studio and surprise each other the next day with what they came up with, which up until this point, with Gynax only working on small-scale projects like OVAs, worked just fine. However, when faced with the monumental task of handling Nadia to quote Okada, it was real chaos, just like hell. Plus, it didn't help that good chunks of the anime were produced entirely in Korea. Thankfully though, through thick and thin, Gynax was able to pull through and Nadia The Secret of Blue Water was released. And while by some miracle, Nadia 
Arya did get made all on time, the leadership at Gynex knew something had to be done about Okada so they wouldn't end up in yet another production nightmare. Thus, after a lot of consideration, the new president of Gynax would end up being Takeshi Sawamura from earlier, with Okada leaving Gynax completely. But unfortunately, to Gynax's dismay, things would only get worse. Remember General Products, the joint company of Gynax that would keep them financially afloat? Well, just like everyone else associated with Gynax, they weren't the most professional businessmen out there, and as a result of overextending themselves far too much, in 1992, they ended up closing shop altogether. However, back in Gynax, things were not looking too great, because with the downfall of General Products, funding projects would become a whole lot harder. At this point, with Gynax not having any clear projects to make, the only actual stream of revenue they were getting was from Takami Akai's games, a fact that isn't exactly ideal for an animation studio who, you know, is supposed to make anime. But Gynax wouldn't be down for the count just yet, as in came Hiroyuki Yamaga, a man who at this point had arguably as much influence within the company as Sawamura with a new idea. The project would be called Uru in Blue, and when fully realized, was to become a sequel to the first Royal Space Force film funded by Bandai all those years ago. So hey, this is good news, right? Now Gynax finally had a new direction to devote themselves to. They'd surely find a way to pull through like before. Well, not really. With the absence of general products and any sort of external funding, there just was not a feasible way for Uru and Blue to even come close to completion. So as a result, for the entirety of 1992, Gynax was pretty much stagnated working on this project, not putting out any other sort of animation while doing so. And it's not like the staff at Gynax were oblivious to this either. Many just flat out left the studio that year, with some of them going on to form Studio Gonzo, a studio I'm sure you've seen some of by now. So with the studio just bleeding staff at this point, Sawamura had to officially break the news that Uru and Blue was really only a pipe dream. And after a full year of pouring resources into it, Gainax barely had enough money to keep itself afloat, much less pay the staff who worked there. Though as I'm sure you all know, Gainax still had one last miracle left to cash in. Neon Genesis Evangelion. Let's go a bit back in time here, because as Gainax was in its Uru and Blue induced slump, Hideaki Anno had a solution. Believe it or not, Anno had not only made a connection with King Records, but through them was finally given a new TV anime to work on. Of course, even when making such a show like Evangelion, when Gynax is involved, there would always be some kind of turmoil to be had. Except, wait a second, in this specific case, it actually wasn't Gynax's fault, for the most part, because while Evangelion is a Gynax anime, the truth of the matter is there were really only three staff members consistently working on the anime at all times. Instead, the majority of Evangelion's production took place at Tatsunoko production. Normally, this would have been good for Gainax, considering Tatsunoko was a much larger studio, but in the end, they'd only complicate things, losing good chunks of Cell animation before it'd even be filmed. Though it's not like Gainax didn't mess up the production of Evangelion either, just take Hideaki Anno, whose style of working on anime isn't exactly suited for something that airs weekly, since unlike many anime directors, Anno didn't plan out how the show would end at all, much less even think about how the episodes he'd write would lead to said ending. Instead, Anno would just work on the anime one episode at a time, creating a scheduling nightmare for the animators. I mean, just look at the last two episodes of Evangelion. I think it's safe to say that Anno's procrastination with the ending did lead to, well, an interesting outcome. But regardless of that, as you all very well know, Neon Genesis Evangelion was a smash hit, becoming so widely popular that to this day, the series is practically a cultural phenomenon. Needless to say, Gainax was saved. After many years of scraping by with barely anything, for better or for worse, they'd been thrust into the spotlight, even making a follow-up movie to provide another, equally confusing ending to the anime. Though with Gainax becoming so unexpectedly popular, it also end up revealing some of the company's darker secrets, particularly the president's, as in an attempt to keep Gainax from ever failing,
failing again, he'd resorted to some pretty illegal tactics to keep Gainax from going bankrupt, mainly committing tax fraud. And we're not talking minor fraud either. Sawamura really went all the way concealing 1.5 billion yen worth of profits from Evangelion. So as a result, in 1998, when Gainax had finally achieved its big break of becoming a successful studio, the then current president Takeshi Sawamura was arrested. Though even with its head of company now being in prison, this hydra of a studio didn't take any time to recover. Gainax had truly become invincible. Or had it? In the years following Evangelion, Gainax never really had to worry about not having anime to produce. It wouldn't even be an exaggeration to say they could literally just throw out a ton of random project pitches, only to have a plethora of sponsors approve all of them. And honestly, due to that fact, I think that's half the reason a lot of Gainax's anime from this time is so widely loved. Take Kazuya Surumaki, for example, who until 2000 had really never directed an anime at all, instead being more of an understudy of Hideaki Anno. Well, in this period of time where just about anything Gainax proposed, no matter how crazy was greenlit, Tsurumaki finally had the chance to direct his very own anime, leading to the absolutely insane OVA, Fully Cooly. Under any other circumstances, the show would have never been created, much less funded. But honestly, and this goes for a lot of anime released under Gainax at this time, if it was coming from the legendary studio that made Evangelion, producers would bend over backwards for a new anime from Gainax. Hell, this would even lead to Gunbuster getting both a sequel and a movie, something that I'm sure was never even dreamed of when the OVA was originally made. But like most things, this golden era was not gonna last forever. You see, after working on quite a few other titles, Hideaki Anno wanted to get back to what had basically become the majority of his directorial reputation, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Now this would have been all fine and good, but there's one catch to this situation. When Anno made this decision, he also decided to leave Gainax completely to make his own animation studio for the upcoming Evangelion projects, Studio Kara, and when doing so, took a good chunk of Gainax's influence with him. This would prove to be a big problem for Gainax going forward, as really the only reason Evangelion or anime like Fooly Cooly even happened to begin with was because of Anno and his connections. But luckily for Gainax, they still had one card left to play, Hiroyuki Imaishi. To set the stage here a bit, Imaishi had been in Gainax since 1994, most notably working on some key animation for Evangelion. Though in 2004, he showed his massive potential with his all-original movie, Dead Leaves, an anime that can really only be described as unbridled chaos. Well, with the lack of Anno to draw in sponsors, Gainax needed a new flagship series, something that would launch the studio back into the spotlight, and as it turned out, Imaishi would be just the guy for the job. This time, having Aniplex behind them rather than King Records, Imaishi would end up creating Tenken Tapa Gurren Lagann, another mecha anime that, like Evangelion before it, became yet another cultural phenomena of its own, really taking the best features from all past Gainax works and mashing them all up into one absolutely insane ride of a show. Yet again, Gainax had struck gold, and yet again rode the wave just like before, unsuspecting of what would soon befall them. Because like with Hideaki Anno, history repeated itself. In 2011, after releasing Panty and Stocking with Garter Bell, Imaishi decided he too had outgrown Gainax and founded Studio Trigger, taking with him a pretty sizable chunk of all the staff that had been working with him up until then. And he wouldn't be the only one either. Quite a few other talented individuals would leave Gainax as well around this time for various reasons, taking the talent Gainax so desperately needed with them. The question is, could Gainax somehow slither out of this situation like before? Well, unfortunately, they just about used all the good luck they had left because what lied ahead was anything but successful. For the next couple of years, Gainax wouldn't make nearly as many 
many shows like they had in their heyday. Like before, they'd pick a new director to represent the studio, they'd make a show and do great and all. Then afterwards, they'd immediately leave for a better opportunity. Not only would this result in Gainax having to once again scrape by sponsor-wise, but they couldn't produce any groundbreaking insane titles like they could a decade ago. And if you take as much as a look at what they've made in the past, say, five years, it's been pretty apparent too. Though it wasn't all that bad, at least the studio wasn't in dire straits like it had been pre-Evangelion, and hey, when you look at that, Hiroyuki Yamaga is actually trying to bring back Uru and Blue. Who knows, maybe it'll work this time. And you know, it probably would have too, if it weren't for those meddling Karas. As just like when it all started, the thing to once again fatally cripple Gainax was their shocking lack of professionalism. Since with Gainax owing Kara, or more specifically Hideaki Anno, around 100 million yen, Kara would end up suing Gainax, forcing them to pay Kara the full amount, completely crushing the studio in the process. I mean, hell, Gainax had to downsize so severely that they're now operating out of a 45-year-old condo. And now, well, that's just about it. Today, Gainax has come full circle as just like the first time it tried to make Uru and Blue, the studio is really on its last legs. Plus, to add insult to injury, the current day Gainax is actually comprised of four splintered offshoots. Gainax West, Yonago Gainax, Gainax Fukushima, and the main studio, who as of now is still somehow working on Uru and Blue. Which, funnily enough, is actually set to come out this year, though whether that'll happen remains to be seen. But all in all, there's no denying the fact that at least in name, the Gainax we've come to know and love is pretty much dead. Though wait a second, what about Studio Trigger and Kara, or really anyone who split off from Gainax? Well, they've all went on to make some truly fantastic stuff, with Trigger specifically being my favorite anime studio to date. So in the end, while the likelihood of Gainax pulling another Evangelion are slim to none, they've definitely earned their place in the vast history of animation. And considering how many animators and artists have been influenced by them, even if Gainax fades away, it'll definitely live on through all the amazing works the studio put out. Also, on a bit of a side note here before we get onto the outro, I really do have to thank all of you for watching this far into the video. This is really my first time making such a super detailed long video like this, and while I doubt it'll really do that great, since I highly doubt half my audience will even care about this video, it's been really fun to make. Though for those of you who did get this far, do tell me in the comments. Would you guys want more content like this every now and then? I know I'd love to make more. Though I'm kinda rambling now, on to the outro. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, do subscribe, and today's cool thing of the day is undoubtedly Studio Trigger. Because honestly, out of any other anime studio today, they really embody the absolute best parts of Gainax, making unconventional shows with stellar animation. Of course, not everything they put out is perfect, but holy shit if it isn't a breath of fresh air among all the other studios out there. And hey, after seeing the teaser for their newest show at Anime Expo, Premiere, directed by the same guy behind Gurren Lagann and Kill la Kill, there's no time like the present to climb aboard the Trigger Express. Plus, they're putting out an anime reimagining of Gridman, and from the episode they showed us at Anime Expo, let me tell you guys, it's gonna be good. So that being said, I'm the RPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic.